Hi, this is Jim Leffler. I'm a resident in medicine and psychiatry at Duke University Hospital. This lecture is going to be on clozapine, which I think is a very uh, unique antipsychotic and is very much kind of a med psych kind of drug, meaning that it works for psychiatry and it has a lot of medicine problems associated with it. So what are those problems? The way I think about it is that it's kind of divided into two two fields. Okay? So one is idiosyncratic. And like usually in that term it just means that you know maybe uh we're idiots and we don't know the cause, but the other the other thought is that these just occur regardless of the amount you're given and then some occur dependent upon dose dependent amounts of the drug that's given. So first, what are these ones? So the first one is myocarditis. And that sounds pretty terrible, right? And the other one is, I think everybody learns this one, agranulocytosis. And what does that mean, agranulo? So no granulocytes, and the granulocytes are your PMNs. So it leaves you uh, with very few um, uh, red cells. Over here, sedation. Uh, is common going along with that, and this is all kind of anticholinergic, is constipation. Other anticholinergic is urinary incontinence. Urinary incontinence. Um, and then, interestingly, pneumonia. And I'll come back to that. And then sialuria. And I have to be honest, in some way, it affects the muscarinic receptor in such a way that the anticholinergic effects seem not to um, seem not to mitigate this. So, in terms of the idiosyncratic um, effects, let's talk about those. Let's talk about those. So, myocarditis. So, what do we need to do for myocarditis? So what we have to do is we got to monitor for it. And it's usually going to happen in the first eight weeks. So we'll get an EKG and then cardiac biomarkers. And I know everybody always says that, and then we expect students to know what those mean. And that's troponin, MB, and then CK. These two are more specific to the heart, and then this is more sensitive but not specific, right? The other things we look for, ESR or a CRP. Um, and these are just looking for factors of inflammation. We think this is mediated by an IgE response. Uh, and then some institutions will get an echo. And, uh, and then what you look for, and if it's the patient having the symptoms, is dyspnea on exertion, shortness of breath, edema, and generally, my understanding, I've not seen it, but it's kind of just a malaise. All right, so that's myocarditis. Then the next one that we'll talk about will be, um, will be um, the A granula. A granulocytosis. A granulocytosis. And again, that means no PMNs, so then you're vulnerable for infection. So, what do we want to look at? A couple of things. So, we look at the CBC, and not just the CBC, we need A and C. And as you guys know, we don't want the A and C to drop below uh, 1500 or 2000. Uh, because less than 2,000, we're con considered neutropenic, uh, and that's a bad thing. And then you're open to opportunistic infection. So you get a CBC every week for several weeks, followed by every uh, every month, followed by every couple of months. I think it's every three months. You'll have to look up on the guidelines how often that's done. But we monitor that, and this information is actually sent into a database. And so anybody that's ever been on clozapine, clozapine, Taza, all the different formulations, have to input the information about that patient into a database, and they follow this CBC because people have died from agranulocytosis. 
Now, I've heard anecdotally that the United States tends to be more uh, risk averse than other nations and that we seem to monitor this a lot when other people do not. So then the uh, dose dependent ones. Dose dependent ones, if you'll remember, are sedation, and we just have to, that's why we have titrate slowly. Constipation, you just make sure that you're monitoring for bowel movements. And then we give them things like Ducolax or Miralax, polyethylene glycol is probably what I should say because I think this is a trade name. Uh, and then uh, other things, but you want to make sure they're having bowel movements because this can actually get pretty serious and people have had ischemic bowel from it. You get like this large fecalith, you can't pass it, that expands, and then people's bowels die. Um, so that's ischemic bowel. Sialuria, that's not spelled right. Sialuria, I'm sorry, I don't know how to spell that. Sialuria just means you salivate a lot. We try to give people glycopyrrolate, uh, or you can get, which is oral, or you can give atropine uh, sublingually. And it actually is pretty distressing to people to see this um, uh, whenever they're having a lot of sialuria. So then you think about pneumonia. Again, anticholinergic, anticholinergic, muscarinic. And then this, uh, I think, and I'm not 100% sure about this, but I think it comes from the fact that you have aspiration risk from increased sialuria, increased sedation. So you can imagine that you're going to increase your opportunity to put um, infection into the lungs. And so we just have to watch for that. And then there's two other things I just wanted to mention. So if you read about Clausarill, You'll read about, uh, sorry, I keep pushing the wrong button, uh, venothromboembolism. Now, I have seen some people give aspirin uh, in prophylaxis against this because we know that in ortho procedures, uh, it's been shown to reduce the incidence of um, venothromboembolism, but it's not like a hard and fast recommendation that I've seen happen. The other thing is that I wanted to bring up was tachycardia. And I've seen some people give a beta blocker, uh, usually propanolol or something to that effect, uh, uh, that slows the heart rate uh, to try and address a possible, um, slows heart rate to address maybe a tachycardic, tachycardia induced myopathy. And, uh, you know, I don't know about that. I don't think the data says one way or the other, but I've seen people do that. Last thing I did want to just kind of talk about was um, with Clozaril is why do we use it? Why do we think it's so great? Clozaril, clozapine. Sorry, I should be using the generic clozapine. Clozaril, it has other formulations. It has a special name. There's actually an ODT tablet. But why do we use it? Well, it decreases suicide, suicidality in a unique way. The only other drug I can think of that does that is lithium. And then it increases, uh, it decreases mortality, is what I meant to say. It doesn't increase mortality, it decreases mortality. Despite all these negative effects, it sounds like, it decreases more. But we don't tend to use it as much because of all the monitoring, uh, and then the the and then like any second generation, and I didn't mention this, but I should put it out there. It's going to cause weight gain, weight gain, and type two diabetes and hyperlipidemia, the metabolic syndrome. But you know, I've heard some people suggest that. This is okay in the setting of this going down because you improve the quality of life. And it's thought that Clozaril, for some uncompletely identified mechanism, actually affects, uh, affects the um, negative symptoms more than other antipsychotics. And so that is the end of this discussion on Clozaril or clozapine, and why I think it's a med psych drug.
Uh, thanks so much.